Good morning, friends, and welcome back to Read Aloud with Miss Cope. Today is Thursday, and it's April 30th, the last day in April, which means tomorrow will be May. We are getting closer and closer to spring. Today is a little bit rainy. It started raining on my run this morning, but I hope it clears up and we can enjoy the rest of the day. So we finished with The Might of Angels by Andrea Davis Pinkney. I wanted to read the epilogue, and then I'll introduce you to the new book that I have for Read Aloud. I'm excited to share it. So, Donnie returned to Prettyman Coburn School in the fall of 1955. In October of that year, the Brooklyn Dodgers won the World Series, beating the New York Yankees. It was a victory for Dodger fans, especially for Jackie Robinson as this was his only championship. The World Series was a personal triumph for Donnie, who listened to the final game of the series on the radio with her family. The morning of October 4th, 1955, marked the final World Series game. On that day, Donnie rang the Prettyman bell louder than ever. Donnie remained the only black student at Prettyman Coburn. The school was slow to integrate, but Donnie graduated from Prettyman Coburn in 1960. She was ranked third in her senior high school class and was the first black student to graduate from Prettyman in the school's 50 year history. In 1963, Prettyman enrolled three more black students, but progress took time. Donnie won a scholarship and attended Boston University, one of the nation's few predominantly white colleges to enroll black students at that time. She went on to receive a scholarship to John Hopkins University in Baltimore, where she earned her medical degree in pediatric medicine. Through her education, Donnie learned the true nature of her brother's special way of seeing things. That's in quotes. Goober had what is known today as autism, a neurobiological disorder. Dr. Donnie Ray Johnson never married. She devoted her life's work to the advancement and understanding of neurological disorders in children. She became an active member of the NAACP. Yolanda graduated from Bethune, also ranking high in her class. She stayed in Hadley, married a local man, and became the choir director at Shepherd's Way Baptist Church. Donnie's parents moved to Richmond, Virginia, the state capital. They successfully opened and operated a chain of dry cleaning stores called Simply Loretta's. People from all over brought their clothes from laundering, tailoring, and pressing. When they picked up their items, they returned home with the cleanest, sharpest dresses and slacks in the state of Virginia. Loretta's employed people of all races. Those who worked for Loretta's took the establishment's promise of excellence seriously. The company's most committed employee was Goober. Gertie and Donnie remained friends like Donnie and Gertie also broke new ground at Prettyman. She was the first Jewish student to graduate. Gertie became a labor attorney who worked on behalf for undeserved Americans seeking fair employment opportunities. Soon after Gertie married in 1975, she had one child, a daughter, whom she named Dawn, after her best friend. Women and men who, who like Donnie, integrated their schools in the 1950s and 60s are still alive today sharing their stories of triumph. Wow. That is a great way to end the story. So both of these girls go on to be very successful. I think that's amazing that Donnie dedicated her life and the rest of her career researching neurobiological um, disorders like autism, right? So that is so amazing to hear. All right. So there's some other information in the back of this book, um, Life in America in 1954, um, giving us some information about the history You know what, I think it would be worth just reading it, learning a little bit more about history back then, life in America, especially for a person of color. So let's go for it. 
Historical note. At one time in America, the laws in many states kept blacks and white citizens separate in public places, including restaurants, movie theaters, buses, hotels, and pools, and children of different races could not go to school together. The law known as Jim Crow laws gave school districts the legal right to keep schools racially segregated as long as they provided an equal education to black and white students. Jim Crow laws upheld the belief that if schools were separate but equal, it was acceptable to keep black and white students apart. But these separate schools weren't the same. Black students were forced to work with inferior materials, shabby books, broken pencils, and facilities that needed fixing. In white public schools, students usually enjoy new books, sport equipment, hot lunches, extracurricular activities. Black teachers were underpaid and underrepresented among state schools officials, and they struggled to get proper learning tools for their students. The fairness of these circumstances made black children and their parents angry. To strike out against these unjust laws, a group of African-American parents from Delaware, Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., worked with the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. They sued the school boards that discriminated against black children. Their case was named after Oliver Brown, one of the parents who lived in Kansas. Oliver's daughter, Linda, was prevented from attending her local all-white elementary school because she was African-American. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of school integration in a case known as Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. As part of the court's decision, it was determined that separate school facilities were not equal and the best way to ensure equality in schools was to allow black children to enroll in any public school they wished to attend. This was not an easy fight. It took the hard work of many determined people to make school integration pos possible. The Brown versus Board of Education ruling brought hope to students and teachers. At the same time though, there were individuals who were strongly against school integration. Most schools did not integrate right away. Progress was slow. Many residents in Southern states resisted integration. In Southern towns, school officials upheld segregation practices despite the law. In September 1954, months after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, schools on military bases in Fort Myer and Fort Belvoir in Virginia and Craig Air Force Base in Alabama integrated. Military base schools were required to comply immediately under federal law. Interesting. Schools in Washington, D.C. also integrated. In the state of Virginia, U.S. Senator Harry F. Bride Sr., a segregationist, promoted a movement known as the Southern Manifesto, which opposed integrating schools. This program was supported by more than 100 Southern government officials. On February 25, 1956, Senator Byard launched an initiative called the Massive Resistance, a movement that led to legislation passed in 1958 intending to prevent school integration. Massive Resistance enacted a law that cut off state funds and closed public schools that agreed to integrate. During this time, Virginia closed nine schools in four counties rather than integrate them. Wow, they were really being resistant to the law. Virginia state courts and federal court ruled against the massive resistance tactics, citing them as illegal. Schools were forced to uphold the laws set forth under the Brown versus Board of Education ruling. Still, less than 2% of Southern schools were integrated by 1957. That year, nine African-American students known as Little Rock Nine enrolled in Central High School, an all white school in Little Rock, Arkansas. Their bravery captured the attention of Americans throughout the nation as the violent events surrounding their attempts to enter Central High School were covered by national news media. 
The same was true in 1960 when six-year-old Ruby Bridges was the first black child to attend William France Elementary School, a white school in New Orleans, Louisiana. Although these integration stories are the most well-known, many brave black children enrolled in all white schools after integration laws were passed. Despite the taunts and abuses of segregationists, these children proceeded with strength and dignity. Wow, that makes me a little emotional there. School integration enraged and frightened many people and stirred racial tensions. As a result, African-American children and adults were often tormented by those who believed in segregation. At the time, other people stood up for what was right. They banded together and worked hard to make inter integration a reality. So despite a law being passed, Brown versus Board, people, for example, counties in Virginia, still they refused to integrate their schools to the point where they closed down many schools. Um, these people called segregationists, they believe so strongly that people of color and white kids can go to the same school. They would do unkind things to people in the African American community. It's very hateful, very hateful things, but these these kids who were brave enough to go to school, even though they knew that they would be persecuted and treated unfairly, they went anyway. They had the bravery and courage. And to all the other people in groups like NAACP, who they were determined to make things equal for their children, parents especially, um, they were the determined and they persevered. I think persevere, perseverance is an important word. You keep trying and you never stop um, trying, especially if it's something you believe strongly in. So the rest of the book, there are some pictures um, of what life was like during that time. So water fountains, white and black only. Some other pictures here. Wow. Here are two of our heroes here. You have Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King who preached about nonviolence, fighting back with peace instead of violence. We also have Rosa Parks here. She refused to give up her seat on the bus. And the last part of this book, real people mentioned in Donnie Ray's diary. So Mary McLeod Bethune, she founded the Bethune she founded this Bethune School. Harry F. Briard, the fifth governor of Virginia. Martin Luther King, Jackie, Jackie Robinson, Thurgood Marshall. He was an attorney in the Supreme Court case Brown versus Board. And he served on the Supreme Court. There's even a civil rights timeline and about the author. So I'm so glad I got to read this book with all of you. Thank you for listening. Um, the next book I wanted to start with you friends is called It Ain't So Awful Falafel. And I can just read the back cover to give you an idea of what this book is about. And next time, tomorrow, we'll start reading it. Zamarod 
quote Cindy Youssef said is the new kid on the block hopefully I got her name right for the fourth time California's Newport Beach in her family's latest perch and she's determined to suck her brainy loner persona and start afresh with a new Brady Brunch name. It's the late 1970s and fitting in becomes more difficult as Iran makes U.S. headlines with protests, revolution, and finally taking of American hostages. Neither summer camp nor puka shell necklaces can distract Sydney from the anti-Iran sentiments that creep way too close to home. So this is about a young girl. She had to change, she changed her name to Sydney actually when she moved to California, New Beach in the 1970s. And as an Iranian, what was life like for her in this new place? So I'm excited to read, start reading this with all of you. I will see you tomorrow. I hope you have a great Thursday. You're almost to the weekend. You got this. Thank you everyone, toodles.